Hi, I'm Mason Vale from Boise State University, and this video will introduce the object-oriented programming concept of polymorphism. I'm using Java for my examples, but the concepts here should apply to most modern object-oriented languages. Polymorphism is one of the pillars of object-oriented programming, or one of the big ideas. Polymorphism is a very powerful tool that can be used to create elegant programs, and it's made possible when objects share at least some common ancestry, either through inheritance, class inheritance, or by implementing a common interface. Let's start by reviewing what an object reference actually is and what happens when an object is created. An object reference tells us where to find an object stored somewhere else in memory. It isn't the object itself. When we call methods or access variables using an object reference and the dot operator, we're actually following the address to the actual object and then accessing the method or variable with that name in the actual object. It isn't until we actually follow the reference and look up the method in the object that we find out what the method does. This just-in-time dynamic access is called late binding. When a class constructor is called, an object of that type is instantiated in memory with the properties and methods defined in the class, and it's initialized according to the code in the constructor you used. The location of that object in memory is returned and usually assigned to a compatible object reference. So here's the big surprise. The object reference and the object may not be exactly the same type. All that is necessary is that the object type is compatible with the object reference type. It has to be true that the object is an instance of the reference type. In other words, the reference type has to be an ancestor of the object. For example, if a dog class extends a mammal class, dog is a mammal. Everything that was defined in the mammal class is inherited by dog, so a dog object can be assigned to a mammal reference. Mammal m equals new dog. With this mammal reference, you can safely call any methods a mammal is supposed to have, because you know that only compatible objects can be assigned to that reference. It's not necessary to know exactly what kind of object is stored in the reference when you make the call. It could be a dog object, a cat object, or any other descendant of mammal. Any descendant will have some version of the method defined in mammal. When that method is called, late binding will result in following that reference to the actual object and getting its specific version of that method. If mammal has a speak method, then when we call the m.speak method, we're going to get the dog version of that method. m.speak would result in perhaps woof. Likewise, if we had assigned a cat object to our m reference and we call m.speak, we'll get meow. And if we assign a professor object to our mammal reference, we might get do your homework. Three different kinds of objects were stored in the same variable at different times, and the same m.speak method was called, but it produced three different results because of late binding. The mammal m object reference was polymorphic. It had different forms each time it was used. A critical thing to know about using polymorphic references is that the reference type decides what methods are available. The object at the other end of the reference may have additional methods, but the only methods available are those that were available in the reference type. Dogs may be able to fetch, but if a dog is stored in a mammal reference, that method is off limits. The dog can only do things that all mammals can do. A frequent use of polymorphism is collecting related objects into an array or collection, like a list, and performing shared operations on all of the objects in the collection. Instead of having one mammal reference, like in the previous example, we could have an array of mammals and call all of their speak methods sequentially in a loop. Now don't be thrown off by the statement that creates an array of mammal references, even though mammal is an abstract class. Creating the array doesn't call a mammal constructor or instantiate any mammal objects. It only creates mammal references. If you can create one variable of a type, you can create an array of that type also. Although an object can only be constructed from a concrete instantiable class, a reference can be a class, abstract class, interface, enumerated type, anything. Let's say we have an interface speaker with one method speak. Even though there's no constructor to create a speaker object, we can create objects from classes that implement speaker and assign them to speaker references. Just as with class inheritance, any object that implements speaker is a speaker. 
if mammal implements speaker, then all child classes of mammal also implement speaker and must have a speak method to be an instantiable class. So if we create an array, speaker array speakers equals a new speaker array of size 3 and assign our mammal descendants to those references, we have a polymorphic collection of speaker objects that all know how to speak. And when we call them in a loop, the dog goes woof and the cow goes moo. Without knowing it, you've probably been using polymorphism a lot. The for each loops I've been using in the last several of examples actually depend on polymorphism. A for each loop requires a collection that implements a particular interface, iterable, with a method that returns a reference to another interface, iterator, with has next and next methods for returning all of the elements in the collection one at a time. The loop doesn't care exactly what kind of iterable collection it works with, or the exact kind of iterator, as long as they support those interfaces. The print methods in system.out can take object references, and that argument is of type object, the same object class that's at the root of all inheritance hierarchies. So any kind of class reference will be compatible with object. All the print method needs is something with a two-string method. It doesn't need to know anything else about the object. If you've ever worked with graphical user interfaces in Java, they're also hi highly polymorphic. Containers like JPanel collect and organize JComponents. They don't actually care if those components are buttons or labels or any other panels. They only need to know that the objects have the methods that all JComponents share. Event listeners in GUIs are also polymorphic. When you register a listener, it's only necessary that the object is compatible with the appropriate listener interface for the kind of event you're listening for. So it turns out all of polymorphism can be summarized in two statements. An object reference can be assigned any compatible object, and the reference type limits what methods you can call, but the object at the other end determines what the method will do. It's a little like chess. You can learn all the rules in a few minutes, but then spend a lifetime trying to put them to good use. I hope this introduction to polymorphism has been helpful. Thanks for watching.